In our increasingly electrified society, that's where a resilient grid matters most. ITC Great Plains builds, operates, and maintains electric transmission infrastructure, connecting consumers to lower cost energy sources to power our energy future. That means safe, secure, reliable electricity for those we serve. Learn more at itc-holdings.com. Welcome to the Kansas Legislature. We are live here on Smoky Hills PBS in downtown Bunker Hill with a couple of area legislators this evening. I'm your host, Becky Kaiser. We want to welcome you to the show, and we also want to say thank you to our partners bringing the Kansas Legislature to you, ITC and also the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort Hayes State University. Again, I'm Becky Kaiser, and I am with Eagle Communications in Hayes with the Eagle Radio Stations and also Hayes Post News. We want to welcome two of our legislators who worked so hard for us. To my left is Representative Ken Rogers with the 110th District, Republican from AGRA. He always says that, and I always put a long mark over my A, so I'm getting that right every time. And then also, of course, a very familiar face, Representative Troy Waymaster is joining us. He is the 110th, 109th District Representative, Republican from Bunker Hill. And Troy, we're going to start with you this evening, and we're just going to go totally off topic here because you have some really big, exciting news to share with us. We did have some pretty uh, big news uh, or as a family front, uh, in the beginning of session, uh, we had twin sons that were born on January 24th, oh. which was, uh, it caused some scheduling issues, uh, actually, because that was the night of the State of the State speech, because oh, it had to be bumped back because the governor had a false positive at the beginning of ses session and right. couldn't have the State of the State uh, speech when you normally would have it. And so it was on January 24th. And uh, so, yeah, so about two, two and a half weeks old, and everything is going well, so Good. thank you. And their names? <laughs> their names are uh, Chancellor Lee and Charles Nicholas. Oh, I like that. And how's mom doing? Mom is doing good. Uh, probably needs more sleep, uh, <laughs> but she's doing good. And then their four-year-old brother is adapting as well, but uh, he's doing well also. That's thank a you. big change for everybody. Well, <laughs> yes, congratulations. We thank want you. to say that to you. Well, let's start off with you, Troy. And again, a reminder that part of the reason we're here this evening is that so that you can make comments or perhaps you have a question of our legislators this evening and you can call us toll free. That number is 1-800-337-4788. But Troy, again, let's start with you, if you All would, right. to introduce yourself to everyone again and remind us of the committee work that you're doing. All right. I am a uh, Representative Troy Waymaster of the 109th Kansas House District, and because of redistricting, actually I have somewhat of a new district, as I believe also does Representative Rogers. Uh, so right now I represent the entire counties of Russell, Ellsworth, Lincoln, Osborne, and Smith. Um, I lost the counties of Jewell and Rush and Barton uh, with redistricting, uh, but I have entire counties uh, with the new redistricting process. So. That makes it a little bit easier for scheduling and also it makes it less confusing for the constituents sure. on who exactly their representative is. Um, I'm actually starting my seventh um, session as the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, which also has me being chairman of the Legislative Budget Committee, a member on the State Finance Council. And then one thing that we might talk about when we're talking about state employee pay is during the interim uh, before session started, I was actually the chairman of the Special Committee on state employee compensation and benefits. Um, so we had a lengthy conversation about what we can do for our state employees. Um, I also served as vice chairman of the Legislative Budget Committee. Um, and this coming year, when we're out of session, I'll be the chairman of the Legislative Budget Committee because it switches between the House and the Senate each year. So you're a numbers guy. I'm a numbers guy, yes. <laughs> All right. Let's also talk with Ken Rogers. And Ken, I know that you uh, are very well known for your work that you've done with the Ag Committee, and you continue to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not near as busy as the chairman, <laughs> but uh, um, 110th District is uh, just some slight changes, not that dramatic, but now I have, uh, have all of Graham County. That was added. Ellis County increased a little bit. The 111th, primarily from Hayes to Victoria, and a little bit there along old Highway 40. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, Norton, Phillips, Rooks, Graham, and then uh, we call basically most all of rural Ellis County now. So 
did, did learning a few more people in kind of in that south uh, eastern part of, of Ellis County and then get the full uh, deal of Graham so that's good so we're still doing representing a lot of oil producers mm -hmm. and uh, and so that's good I um, let's see this is my eighth uh, year in the legislature now and uh, I serve on the appropriations committee with the uh, uh, chairman Waymaster and also in higher education budget then I am a chairman now of the Ag Committee this is the third year and I'm also on the special claims against the state that's something new we haven't met yet but uh, that is one I thought that uh, it, it's it's probably a good service to at least try because you know you get a better idea too of of some of those that, that have some concerns and so uh, we'll see well, let's talk about that since that is brand new. You, you, as you said, you haven't met any, done anything met yet, but what do you expect to have happen there? Well, you know, in, in appropriations, we get kind of what the committee decides uh, is worthy for consideration. So I believe they're all day meetings and you sit there, folks have maybe uh, an inmate had an issue or somebody feels they were aggrieved against the state and, or an unclaimed uh, uh, situation. We hear their story, go through it, and then make recommendations that go on to the Appropriations Committee. I, I believe that's the way it works. That is the way it works. It, just, it switches on every year. So this year the Senate is actually taking oh. the lead mm -hmm. uh, with the special claims against the state. Next year the House right. will take it. Right. But uh, the you know, chairman is exactly right on how it works. Yeah. Is you hear the cases and then they make recommendations to the budget committees in the House and the Senate. I didn't realize that that was available. That's, and how do constituents find out about that? You through know, their uh, lawyers? <laughs> well, I, I would think that, that through probably various different channels um, that uh, probably asking a lot of questions. I, I, I'm still learning on that one. I, I don't know. I, was, uh, I got a phone call from the speaker right before session started and said, you know, we know you're a little ways away from Topeka, but would you be interested in doing this? And, and so I thought, well, you know, I've had a lot of fun. So this, I don't know if this is that much fun or not, but I think, I, I think um, you know, it's a good service. Sure. And I think... Uh, uh, to learn more too about about this situation just so that that's kind of why I did it and uh, like I need something else to do but I think it's important well we appreciate the the work that you'll be doing soon no doubt get a reminder that our phones are open this evening uh, toll free to call if you have a question or comment for our representatives 1-800-337-4788 is the number to call and I thought Troy we might start with you talking about uh, budget and and those kinds of discussions yes. when I got your <laughs> newsletter I was astounded to see how many budget discussions you have sat through recently there are a lot of groups and committees out there there are quite a few agencies and departments and commissions that we will hear the budgets for uh, we just started that on tuesday um, so we're in the beginning stages of getting the budgets re reported back from the budget committees to the appropriations committee and that will actually continue until around mid-march um, we're starting out pretty minor and, and with, with slight budgets uh, right now a lot of fee funded agencies and then once we get towards the um, the end of the process like I said in mid-March we're going to be talking about your larger uh, depart departments and agencies and what they're asking for but I'm trying to think exactly how many budgets we listen to this week and it's probably got to be around 12 to 15 um, that we we uh, listen to and got budget report backs from the budget committees so what is your exact purpose in hearing these are you in charge of telling them what they can and cannot do with this money? Precisely. I mean, that's exactly what happens. So the budget committees are charged with actually having the hearings on each individual budget, and we have six budget committees. And the budgets, once we get the budget from the governor, our research department breaks those up, and then we decide which budget committee is going to hear those particular budgets. They hold those hearings, and they report those back to the Appropriations Committee. The members on the Appropriations Committee then has to holistically put the entire budget back together. Um, so we will hear the information from the chairman who report that back, and then we will make changes and modifications or pass the budget as it was reported to us um, into the Appropriations Committee, and then that is how we're piecing the state budget back together. Uh, but we do have the purview of making any changes that um, if the committee uh, passes it with a majority, uh, we make changes to those budgets. I know which has caused some angst with some of the members on the budget committees. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but then again, like I said, we have to look at the budget as, as a whole. And we have to put it back together to make sure that we're having a balanced budget by the time we send that to the House floor. 
so pieces of the puzzle that you're taking exactly. out and putting back together. Yeah. Does it ever happen that it that it passes your purview and no changes are made? Is that very common? Oh, it's it, pretty common right now. Mm -hmm. um, a lot with your fee-funded fee agencies, uh, which don't have any state general fund dollars, mm -hmm. um, they're not really asking for a whole lot. Um, so we just passed the recommendations that were made by the agency or department that was recommended by the governor and then recommended by the budget, uh, budget committee. Uh, but then you'll get into the larger ones like I like I said I was at a funeral last night So I actually had to have my vice chair step in as chairman today in the appropriations committee and today We had the Department of Ag and the Department of Wildlife and Parks Which are probably the two biggest that we've have heard so far um, And there were some changes and modifications that were made from the recommendations from the budget committee um, And so we're going to be addressing those uh, when we start moving forward with the state budget do you have an insight into that, Ken? Yeah, Ken, Ken was there. <laughs> I, I, I was there, and I probably I I um, inserted, I guess, the chairman's prerogative, even though we, you know agriculture natural resources has their own budget, but uh, also under the Department of Agriculture, or not the department, but but the Ag Natural Resource Budget is also the Water Office. Ah. Of course, water is a huge issue. Yes, mm -hmm. and so th that's where it was, and as and as um, the governor has. Uh, looking at, at, at maybe finally getting another assistant secretary of agriculture and so on the way the way it was presented with some of the enhancements based on the investment we're making in water it was there was some um, maybe confusion on how those numbers all came together so instead we just we were able to kind of uh, dissect it just a bit move on with some of those enhancements but since some of the salary increases one of the things Becky we're dealing with as you know uh, is is the disparity where the marketplace is and where we are and even some businesses are as trying to get employees or retain employees especially some of those specialty ones and so we may have to do more than say what we would do in a good year of a five percent raise we may have to bump more in some cases to get some of those professionals and others to keep their positions there and so that's one of the things we're finding in, in this budget is taking maybe some aback when we see big increases and maybe not increases in employees but simply a matter of inflation. Inflation now is, 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 right. is you know, it's seven to nine, however you want to say, you know, wh wh whatever you have put in there, that adds to, co that adds to what, you know, uh, uh, salaries, uh, uh, benefits, uh, and just really the, the doing business that we have to remember because uh, Becky, it was a long time that the economy was such where uh, we were almost at zero interest money on so many things. So now it's a different thing that we have to kind of maybe in a new paradigm for now that we got to keep in mind as we do these, but without getting getting out of control with with, with spending all our surplus. At least that's my idea. well. And going off of Ken's comments in regards to state employee pay, so one I had a meeting with the governor on Tuesday, particularly about this issue, uh, because she and I have starkly different. Um, uh, areas that we would like to address and as I mentioned in my opening comments that I was uh, the chairman of the uh, state employee uh, pay and compensation and benefit committee and one thing that we found out is we have numerous em employees within the state that are considerably under market and so my initiative and what I've kind of uh, uh, challenged the appropriations committee is to let's, let's focus on those under market positions and bring what them up. What do you mean market. by under market? Mm -hmm. So th these are positions that if they would go into the private sector, they would make a considerable lot more money. And we are losing these good employees to the private sector that for that reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of uh, employees that are under market, some by 30 to 35 percent below under wow. market. And so the one discussion that I was having with Governor Kelly is. If we do a 5% across the board pay increase, which she um, introduced in her budget, mm -hmm. you're just widening that disparity of the ones that are under market and those that are over market. Because we do have employees that are currently over market as well. And so we need to start to have a consensus and drive down uh, a, an idea of where we can bring those under market employees close to market and then focus on that and then maybe look at a pay increase in future years. And, and also, we got to make sure we don't get that disparity so much, you know, out of line because we all know even in the private sector in those jobs, but, you know, you're starting out $15, 17 $20 an hour, 
uh, that that probably that that will not be the that will not be the new plateau. We will probably back back down again as we go, but once once you give an employee a raise or you raise your cost, it's very hard to back that back off again. Even as the economy may be turning when it turns back around, so uh, maybe looking at some sort of retention or uh, signing mm -hmm. bonus or things like that. But the one example that that I always like to use is. Um, is, is or, the, or the engineers we have in the Department of Agriculture dealing with water. It's taking far too long, well over a year, to get a water permit uh, finalized within the Department of Agriculture simply because we do not have the engineers. And so, and when you offer a very good, seemingly, salary and benefits, it's a nice package, but it's not enough to encourage folks to come. And I, I addressed this before with previous secretaries of, of other departments. You know, we, we, we've got to get beyond this and, and, and make working for state government for some folks, I mean, it, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And well, so, historically, that's something that people, you know, has, talk yes, about, right. strive for, and, and really enjoy. I'm curious, would it take a special study? Um, um, are the legislators themselves qualified to make those decisions? Or I'm thinking in my experience with uh, city and county, uh, commissions that they hire that out to people who specialize well, in it. We, we have post audit, mm -hmm. legislative post audit, and they actually did conduct a study on employee pay, and that's where this report came back okay. with the positions that are over market, at market, and under market. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave it to you know citizen legislators to make that decision <laughs> of what the, what what the value of an employee is. I think the professionals do that, but also I think we as legislators though need to maybe ad adhere to that. A lot of times we do. I mean, I could show you uh, uh, back rooms full of studies that have dust on them that we never really acted on. And so that's where, um, you know, I think we're at that point now of condition critical in many of these places that w that, that may be one of those, as I always like to call, a good investment that maybe we, that we do need to take seriously to a look at. Do you ever compare Kansas to other states? We're talking about the private sector here, yes. but how does Kansas compare then? Well, when you talk about the comparison to other states, and we were talking, I was talking about this with Governor Kelly, and I was talking about this in that special committee, <clears throat> and it was actually namely with the Department of Corrections, and this is in your district, Norton. Uh, the Norton Correctional Facility has a starting wage of eighteen sixteen an hour, but yet in Nebraska, there is a correctional facility that is pretty much close proximity, and their starting wage is twenty eight dollars an hour. Mm. So the one proposal that I was mentioning to the governor is that we stop doing across the board pay increases and we start looking at each market differently because each one is going to have different paradigms that we're going to have to address. For example, Ellsworth Correctional Facility that's in my district, which Ellsworth has a very low unemployment rate, but they're having problems attracting applicants. So what can we do in the Ellsworth Correctional Facility, even though the rate is competitive, what can we do to entice applicants? That's where a sign-on bonus might come into play. Um, El Dorado is going to have its own different environment um, down in that correctional facility. Sure. And then we start talking about Larned and Osawatomie. They're completely different because Osawatomie is outside of the Kansas City metropolitan area, per se, um, and Larned is in a strictly rural area. Mm -hmm. So, and actually the governor did kind of agree that we need to start looking at it as a market region as opposed to just a flat across the board pay increase, which we'll I was see. pleased to hear. Yeah. We want to remind you that we have the telephone lines open now for you to call to make a comment or maybe ask a question of the legislators. And again, that number is 1-800-337-4788. Ken, I wanted to return back to you and, and talk a little bit uh, about the water situation. And I know that there, it, I find it very interesting having basically grown up in western Kansas where we've always been concerned about water and especially with the city of Hayes that's a leader in water savings conservation for the state. Now the rest of the state seems to be paying attention to the commodity and precious resource that water is. I understand that there was a bill introduced uh, regarding groundwater management districts mm -hmm. and they're reporting to the state and that they should be conserving water, that there should be some sort of mandate for that. Mm -hmm. There was a hearing this past week. The chairman, by the way, is Jim Minix from, from Scott City, a uh, good legislator and a good head on his shoulders. and He's probably the right person for that job. And so uh, there's been two or three bills uh, that 
that are really trying to, to start this process. Uh, there was a hearing. Uh, it was fairly okay, Fair, if that's the right term. I mean, there was there was one that that took a little heat. One of one of the uh, uh, groundwater management districts. But I think part of it, Becky, if you, if you take a step back, and I've said for a long time, this is going to be the issue of the, of the legislature. Mm -hmm. It seemed like everybody now has an opinion of water. My frustration with this is people from the other side of the state determine, which have different water issues, trying to dictate what happens in western Kansas and southwest Kansas. You know, southwest Kansas shouldn't tell Johnson County to water their yards, but kind of vice versa. Johnson County, Topeka should not be telling Southwest Kansas when they can irrigate. There's been some words, there's been some phrases that folks have picked up on that I consider quite incendiary when you talk about Western Kansas. When you take an, a real look at this, most farmers and most, I guess, big air, water users, which would be irrigators, mm -hmm. and some industries have done a good job. They realize in order to keep their business and to keep that for generations, they need to do a good job, and most of them are. We're working on that right now through this whole process. One of those is, is, is this, and, and the groundwater management districts to come to the legislature I think is fine. I think most of them want to do that. The things they're asking for uh, are, are things they do now as far as you know, where they're spending the money, what some of the efforts. Now, some of this will be changed. It has, as they, they're going to work the bill, I believe, next week. So some of the things that are demands are more like shells. Now, some people probably think it should maybe be a little bit stronger, but I think in order to get buy-in, let's, let's not, you know, we're not yet to have the heavy hand. Local control is the most important. Who knows best? It's that local. Look at the good things we've done, especially in the Northwest, with that groundwater management district four, mm -hmm. and the Sheridan six, those, those six farmers got together in Sheridan County and have seen reduction, they've re reduced their water usage, still see good, good crop yields. So I, I, I think as long as, as long as we have the voluntary cooperation, local control through those groundwater management districts, we're going to get there. This situation was not created in one or two years, the last three years of the drought we've had. This has been 50 years in the making. And let's remind the state of Kansas did those water rights. There, this isn't a wild, wild west like some folks think. And so um, it's, it, you know, it, I think we're, we're in a good course to build a plan and to get, to get moving. There's, there's another, the, the bigger one is looking at a funding source to help fund some of these uh, programs and, and other things that will also be worked on. And so with that, you know, that, that is going to be, I think, uh, maybe not without a little controversy, but I think that's the way where, as we can raise a good stable source to help with the water plan funding and some of those measures that are in place. The other thing, Becky, we don't know yet is all that coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act for the feds. There's a lot of money in there coming for in, in that conservation and in, in uh, some of those type situations. We don't know exactly for sure. For, for water know. conservation? For water or, or other <coughs> conservation oh, okay. programs. We don't really know yet, but, but so anyway. So yeah, that's the thing with the bipartisan <laughs> infrastructure bill. We don't know a right. lot. <clears throat> Even it was passed last year, there is still a lot of questions right. exactly how much money is going to uh. be uh, distributed throughout for the different uh, the myriad of uh, organizations that are going to be receiving uh, money uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure bill. We have a caller on the phone with us right now, Nick from Russell. Do you have a question or comment for our legislators this evening? Yes, I do. Um, I was going to kind of piggyback off of what a couple of the folks have said. You know, Ken kind of talked about some of the water issues and the divide between the western and eastern parts of the state. And, you know, and then uh, Mr. Waymaster was talking about, you know, the issues with state employees. And I was wondering, you know, if there's a, if you think any of this fits together as a problem with the kind of depopulation of the western part of the state and if some of these issues can help with some of that or what other initiatives is the state doing to help with the depopulation of the western part? 
We do know there are fewer people out here in rural Kansas, Western Kansas. Yes. And the Waymasters are helping that, though. They're well, yeah. well, that's true. <laughs> we just added to the Western Kansas population. <laughs> well, <clears throat> but Troy, what 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 is? I mean, does that put us at a disadvantage that fewer people? literally living out here, although obviously a lot of the ag is in western Kansas as well. It is. I mean, ag is throughout the entire state of Kansas, and uh, but predominantly it's a major economy in western Kansas as opposed to um, eastern and south central. Um, the one thing that Ken and I have to do when we're at the legislature is to educate our colleagues on the eastern side and the south central side how important agriculture is and how important water is and how important western Kansas is. Um, to the overall state of Kansas. Um, I was, when Ken was talking about his comments, I was reflecting back, back in December when I actually flew to Reno and toured the Panasonic plant, very similar to the plant that's going to be built in DeSoto. Uh -huh. However, the plant in DeSoto is going to be larger than the one that we toured in Reno. On the plane, on, on the plane ride back, I was with a senator from eastern Kansas, and he had made the comment uh, when we started talking about water and he said well we're tired of paying for the water issues that you caused in western Kansas that's the mentality that Ken and I have to rebuff when we're in Topeka and we have to say well we're the we're the ones that feed you mm -hmm. um, we're the ones that raise the children that go to school and then in some cases they end up moving to your area of the state um, so we need to collectively work together, um, not as Eastern Kansas, Western Kansas, South Central Kansas. We need to work as Kansans as a whole because this is not an issue, as Ken mentioned, this is not just a Western Kansas issue. It is an entire state of Kansas issue um, as far as, as the water issues. Um, in regards to the state employee pay and, and how that might help with Western Kansas, obviously we need to look at the entities that we have here. Um, I mentioned Larned before. Uh, Larned is very unique um, in the state of Kansas because it is the only campus in the state where it has a correctional facility and it also has a state hospital. And so we have to address Larned differently than we address any other correctional facility and we have to address it any different or we have to address it differently than any other state hospital because we have the two of them on the same campus and it is a massive campus if you ever happen to tour Larned um, Correctional Facility and the State Hospital. Um, the issue is, is trying to find individuals to uh, work at the Correctional Facility and at the State Hospital. And so that was one of the things that I was discussing with the Governor on what, we were, what are we going to do with Larned. One thing that I've tried to um, partner with is with Fort Hay State University and Barton County Community College, two higher um, institutions, higher edu education institutions that are close proximity to Larned and both have um, nursing or social worker programs mm -hmm. and just trying to let the graduates know that you do have an opportunity here in western Kansas and if your desire is to stay here there are jobs for you here. You know you say your desire mm -hmm. and maybe college kids I don't know if they think about that it seems like college kids it's like I'm gonna get out of here whatever wherever my hometown is go somewhere but the idea of coming back to better your own community in an environment that perhaps is better to raise a family there's a lot of that to be said for the more rural areas as well it is an education process of not only the legislators as you mentioned but our uh, the people who live here as well and the one thing that i would say is i think um, covid19 expedited uh, the way we look at business and the way that we actually um, you know, continue our, our livelihood um, because now you're able to remotely work yes. from a rural area as long as we have the accessibility to it. Uh, but you can work from home and you know still work for a Fortune 500 company um, in in Osborne, Kansas. I mean, and that was one of the things that I will say. One of the good things that COVID-19 happened is it made us evolve into a different business platform. You bring that up, Troy, and that's one of my uh, points that I had for this evening to talk about. Uh, Governor Kelly's staff is going to start a Kansas Broadband Road Show. Then they'll be in uh, in Great Bend in March 6th, but they're, they want to find out from people what is the internet like in your area? Do you have the high-speed access? Do you have good connectivity? And what can we do to help you, some sort of action plan? It's probably more important than it ever has been. 
Oh, it is. It's extremely important. And the one thing that I would say is everybody seems to um, have the target on central and western Kansas that we don't have the accessibility with broadband as does the more um, metropolitan areas of the state. And that's not true. There are, there are areas of Wichita that don't have connectivity. Really? There are areas that they don't have broadband, and they have actually very um, a poor access to the Internet. Um, so it, it's not a rural issue, uh, which a lot of people tend to point that that's mm -hmm. what it is. I mean, look at Next Tech and what they, the infrastructure they put in in western and central Kansas, and that gives everybody that lives in, you know, in their footprint the availability of Internet access. Uh, there, are, there are pockets um, in the state that do not, and we need to address that. And as Ken mentioned, that's one of the other areas of the bipartisan infrastructure bill mm -hmm. that we're trying to uh, identify exactly how many dollars we're going to be receiving from the federal government for broadband, broadband accessibility. Uh, the other is we had the SPARC committee process, right. uh, and one of the advisory panels was connectivity, and they focused primarily on broadband. And so we have $30 million that's going, that has been approved for broadband in that aspect, but then we're still waiting on a, anywhere from the 80 to $90 million that might be coming down from the federal government in regards to broadband. But I, I recall when I had the opportunity to tour um, Microsoft in uh, Tacoma, Washington, and we had a meeting and they were talking about a small town in New Hampshire or Vermont, I can't remember what eastern uh, state it was. And it was a town of less than 1,500 people. And they identified that if you, they wanted economic development, they had to have access to the internet. They had to have broadband. And that went from healthcare, economic development, education, it covered all the aspects that they were trying to grasp. And that is, I think, one thing that we have been focusing on in the state. And we need to focus on the areas of rural Kansas that don't have access to the internet, but also there are areas in the metro parts that do not as well. I did not know that about Wichita. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about something different, uh, something that applies to all of us in Kansas that has been in the news quite a bit lately. We've been, uh, and there's some dis uh, discussion going on about it, the foster care program in Kansas, and, and Kansans themselves are saying something has to change. It's not operating very well and we've had some really sad stories come out about it and one thing I saw just recently there's discussion of uh, and this focused on one uh, two particular families but the foster family had basically raised a mm -hmm. child from infancy and then because the this child had some siblings and they couldn't adopt all of them together mm -hmm. the infant well it was no longer different that the child went with the siblings to a family they didn't know relative they didn't know that seems like common sense and yet I'm sure there are a lot of parameters that have to be taken into consideration. Comments? Well, the system's broken. The system has been absolutely shattered and we have tried, Becky, we have tried to work with the secretary to get this solved and everybody throws up their hands. Oh, it's going to get fixed. What doesn't get fixed? Um, there's a lot of different things Republicans can do, maybe start at the top. Secretary Howard's a fine person. I'm not going to go into personalities but it's not working. It is not working. Now, to say this started 40 years ago, no, it started even before that. Mm -hmm. um, that we've got to figure out why the system's broke. Situations like that, which they happen far too often, where a loving family or a loving foster family just wants to help or just, you know, and then either to get that taken away or, or the other type of scenario where we have children having to sleep in the offices or, you know, being a different house home every night. It makes it very difficult. And so I know we, 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 we throw our hands up in, in what to do. Well, we try. We try from a legislative standpoint. I mean, uh, we just, you know, we, this is one of these things that's frustrating because, oh, well, let's have another, we'll have a conference or we'll have a study done. And then what happens to that? And, and so, uh, I mean, I, I really don't know what to say. I mean, it's... it's you sound frustrated. Well, very, I mean, very frustrated. We've tried, we tried this, I can remember years ago when I was a legislator working with the past administration and, and saying, you know, there's some things we can do to help as legislators, and the ball just continued to be 
just not picked up and just just mm -hmm. move forward because it, 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 it is it's about helping these these kids plus helping these families and, and having accountability that was part of it that's part of it too and so I mean it is and I mean we've had special task forces we've had interim committees we'd have all these things and in the end here we are it's the same thing we could talk we talked about this probably five years ago right here and here we are still at I it. was on a show where we talked about I it thought, five yeah. years ago so, so where do we go from here then Troy well and I would say in the recent case I think this is a wake-up call for legislators um, because we actually I think we passed a bill some time ago that said you should be looking at placing them with family members and I think that the extent of that had a catastrophic event event in regards to this particular case because as you mentioned this particular child had been raised from infancy um, to now that she's three years old with this particular foster couple those are her parents those are the ones she knows and I really don't think a court of law should have taken her from the only parents that she knew she didn't know her siblings mm -mm. Um, and even at the time that she was taken from them she was saying I don't want to go um, so it, it's a heartbreaking issue uh, when we're trying to address that and I think we had some unintended consequences thinking that maybe being with family members is the best and in some cases maybe it's not um, you know back in the Brownback administration when we were having the the media about you know contacting about you know kids sleeping in the offices and how terrible that was but we actually had and actually Secretary Howard um, addressed this very issue because it's happened in the Kelly administration as well um, and as Representative Rogers says this is not something that just happened four years ago this has been going on mm -hmm. for quite some time and we have never been to able to address the issue um, in a way that I think we would like to see fit but when you have a child that is taking out taken from their home in the middle of the night and there's no placement and no place to go they go into the office of the Department of Children and Families and it's not sleeping on a cot next to a cubicle it's actually a room that has a bed and has toys and it, it, it's a very I'm not gonna say it's a very welcoming but it's not a cold um, area as what's portrayed in the newspapers or in the media the reason why they have them stay in the offices and in that particular area is because they do not want to put the child through the trauma again of being pulled out of their home that night taken someplace else and then put into a family that the child doesn't even know and so that is the reason why sometimes you hear the story of them staying in the offices is that the correct avenue no it's probably not but I would say it would probably be better for the child where they feel a little bit more comfortable in the office given the surroundings that they do have there as opposed to being pulled from their family pulled from that office again and then put into another placement area that they have no idea where they're going to be going is there any proposal legislation in the works that may besides another committee report no. I, I wish I wish help? representative Kincannon was here uh, because she is the chairperson of, of child welfare um, I am not aware of anything from the recent events um, that mm -hmm. have occurred um, and so I, I can't say for any legislation that's posing out there right now mm -hmm. Well, we'll hear from her in weeks to come, so we'll yeah. find out. Again, a reminder, if you have a comment or a question of our legislators this evening, you can call toll-free 1-800-337-4788 is that number to call. Let's talk taxes, everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> um, and there's discussion again. Um, I was glad, I, and I don't have, it's me, so I don't have to worry about family expenses, but we have seen the tax come down. Our food sales tax again has come down a little mm -hmm. bit. There's proposal. Uh, let's just ax it imme or almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Are we going to do that? Doubt it. No. We passed a bill in early in the Kelly administration. She vetoed it more than once. Um, it's, I, and I understand. We've had a lot of discussion with a lot of folks. Just do it, do it now. This implementation has been a bit clunky. You know, we had a place in the southeast that didn't quite have everything so it actually was a double taxation that got fixed pretty quickly but still 
Um, I, we probably need to make some more fine tuning because we still have some issues of what is and isn't tax, uh, taxable. Department of Revenue's done a good job. There's a lot of discussions there. Uh, we'll get there, and, and as we look at, you know, the sales tax, um, uh, the, uh, you know, people buying stuff on the online, so our, mm -hmm. or those tax revenues are going up to kind of offset it. So, um, I, I guess I, I guess I, I guess I probably maybe <coughs> spoke too soon, but I don't think that we will do this year go ahead and do the fast track to zero we will continue to work the plan as was passed last year are there still concerns about the money the revenue lost to the state well uh, there, there is but right now the consumptive use tax which is all that that we cleaned up a couple of years ago uh, that collecting all the online sales of course COVID really sh you know we had so much yes. online purchasing and so that is those numbers continue to come up and so I mean there's always those discussions of you know the rely the reliance we've had on on sales tax to pay for some of these programs and so I think with that that is that is kind of booing up our revenues comment Troy well I would say in discussions that I've had obviously taxes and budget go together very very well um, and so in conversations that I've had with leadership um, there is as representative Rogers said there's really no uh, intent to expedite the zeroing out of the food sales tax on groceries um, in this year as proposed in the governor's uh, budget. Um, she wants to have it done in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard that there are avenues that we could do that, but we're going to change what, what the requirements are of what qualifies as food. And that would be the women, infant and children items or WIC items would be classified as the only items that would fall under the 0% tax mm -hmm. on groceries um, now if we would change that to only WIC items there is a proposal to have that done in 2023 and the reduction is far less than we if we leave it what was passed last year on the other hand there is also a bill that was introduced are oh, you on the tax committee no you're not more. you were though I you? was yeah. yes that's what I thought. And a four, four so, year sentence. But there, there, there was actually a bill, it was a bipartisan bill introduced by a Republican and a Democrat that would expand that to prepared food, which mm -hmm. currently under the law that was passed last year mm -hmm. does not classify under the 0% tax mm -hmm. on food on groceries. Um, and so then the question is, when you talk about prepared food, do restaurants fall into that category? Uh, so we have a wide gamut of what we're talking about in regards to the governor's proposal on eliminating that this year because you have on one side wanting to expand it and on the other side to limit what actually classifies as the, the zero percent tax on food. Am I correct in that the four states surrounding Kansas do not have grocery sales tax? Uh, sales tax. Oklahoma has, as I think it's like 2.25 percent. Yeah. Nebraska does not, Colorado does not, and Missouri is does. Very small, it's a very, very small, small percentage. Small. Right. Well, but I think you know, I can remember going back a few years when this whole discussion started. Many of us had our own proposals. Back in one day in committee, we were going through, it was agreed, we were looking at ingredients because I know they talked about different kind of candy bars because of the, their makeup, mm -hmm. what would be taxed and what would not be. That's complicated. It is. And so, <laughs> and, and, and in talking with some attorneys and accountants and so on of how this has even started already, that there's there are some kind of some glitches or some things mm -hmm. that we maybe need to look a little bit at hey i'm all for it i'm 17 miles to the nebraska border and you know about 20 miles from a grocery store and 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 it's a whole other story and even in the convenience stores there but i i think our approach our measured approach is is the best way to do it because again folks remember even though if the state sales tax on that on food goes away there's still the local tax so if right. you have a city tax or a county tax, that's still there. Because I think people thought, well, if it's, if it's we're axing the tax and going to zero, I, you know, and then they'll be surprised when, say, in some counties it's two or two and a half percent. So I always got to keep that in mind. Exactly. Another tax that I wanted to ask you about is a discussion that's been going on about flattening the state's individual and corporate income tax rates. Should we do that? Is it a good thing? Uh, our Western Kansas 
Republican Adam Weskin, or Adam Smith from Weskin chairs that House Tax Committee has been talking about it, whether or not we should do it. What do you think, Troy? Well, you know, and I think I think there's there's a lot of um, positive attributes to a flat tax. It makes the tax code a lot simpler um, in regards to how much you're going to be assessed as far as, as income taxation. Um, however, I would say that the Senate proposal is uh, very costly um, to the state, and that's one thing that I think we want to be cognizant about is when we're looking at tax proposals is that we do not repeat what happened in 2012. Remind uh, us. <laughs> what happened in 2012 was a tax plan that was never supposed to pass in the first place. And um, for, I, I wasn't there. I, I ran in 2012 and was uh, first sworn in in 2013. Uh, but the stories that I heard about how that tax plan came to pass was that basically the Senate crafted a tax plan that they never thought the House would ever pass because it was so bad. And that was the only tax bill that they had in conference. And so the House then took it up to con basically concur with the Senate tax proposal and then it passed. And it was a reduction in income taxes, a reduction in what you could have as far as deductions. Um, and I think we all know what the budgetary uh, consequences were until uh, we uh, restructured that in 2017 um, because I lived many of my first years as did Ken um, dealing with the budget issues with the state of Kansas um, but we do not we don't want that to happen again um, so we need to be uh, very pragmatic on how we move forward with taxes because every and that's the other thing you know you have people come into Ken or I's office and they were talking about oh they have this surplus of two billion dollars well, let's do this and let's do that. Well, no, we can't because some of the things you're asking for, it's a long-term expense. And we're not having the surplus forever. And the same conversation go with taxes. Mm -hmm. Adam Smith, Representative Smith, came up to me and asked me, he goes, what can the budget sustain as far as tax reductions? And I said, cumulatively, anywhere from 500 to 700 million. That gets us in the five-year profile, that still has us with a positive ending balance. Anything beyond that, or if something drastically would happen with the economy, which very may, very may well happen, then it, it's going to be um, detrimental to the state budget. Um, so he, and he kind of had the same idea, and so he's crafting tax policies. I don't know exactly what that is. I meet with the speaker every week, and he and I talk about budget and tax issues, and uh, you know, kind of we're we think need, things need to be, uh, but the Senate proposal for the flat tax is just way too expensive. Too uh, much. It's too much. Agreed? I, yeah, I, I mean, I think it, that's a starting point. Uh, I think people that I've talked to, they want to get it out there and have a discussion. Uh, most of the players are, you know, let's, you know, if, it, if that is too expensive, then is it something, uh, you know, how many different tax brackets do, do, do we eliminate, more, you know, so we're down just a couple or whatever and then what rate I think that may be probably the biggest thing that will happen but you know a flat tax sounds great and you know I can remember back when Steve Forbes said you could be able to fill out your federal tax on the postcard well mm -hmm. in, 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 in theory that's great in practicum it's a little bit different and so um, I think what, what many of us are trying to do is do what's responsible not only from an appropriation standpoint but as well from a tax standpoint so because knowing that you know, as, 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 as Representative Waymaster said, with a five year, we, we look five years out. And even though, yes, the surplus is, 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 is still here, it, you cannot plan for where we are now. What we're trying to do, Becky, is put, good money, put money into CAPERS, put money back in for our rainy day fund or that, that expense that, that if we do hit rough times, that, that we don't have to make draconian cuts in different in different programs and also very much you know our, our, the programs we have now I mean I you know when we had the two billion dollar surplus I, I told people so we had four billion dollars in requests <laughs> and everybody wants what's well, only half it's, it's it's only you know 500 million you know it's like oh really is that all you want I mean and and so it adds up very quickly and so uh, again a good investment is one thing simply to start you know other states did this where Almost every legislator had a new program to start, and they realized, and the, when they did five year out, 
it completely blew the budget out. And so that's, I think, is what's going to happen. We've got some other things we're dealing with. And I, I do want to step back just briefly with the caller, some things we've done for Western Kansas. Last year, we, we spent a lot of time, money, and energy. We got more money for rural housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we, we really propped up uh, uh, that, and a lot of it is working its way back to Western Kansas. All over the state, Becky, we have housing, child care, workforce. And you'll, you'll hear that over the state. And so child care as well, and working kind of some public and private folks as well to address those situations and talking with KDHE so that we, you know, again, I think that's in a crisis mode. And I don't say that lightly because it's true. We got to get people back to work because people are not engaging because they can't have, they can't have child care because they just aren't available. And so, but the housing is the one thing I would encourage anybody that knows a builder come to Western Kansas. I know there's a lot of groups that are working on that and, and to come to our communities. Not only, I mean, Hayes is doing great things, Dodge mm -hmm. City, Garden City, mm -hmm. but also places like Norton and Phillipsburg and Hoxie and others. You know, you know, in Phillipsburg, we have the Amber Wave plant. We have good jobs, people coming in. We need to make sure they have places to live in the area. So there is, that's a good, I hadn't thought about that, but I know that they're advertising. We see it down in the Hayes area. Mm -hmm. um, are there going to be enough houses for the people they're hiring? Uh, somewhere. <laughs> I, I know the folks around Phillipsburg and Phillips County are working hard, working with the state. And, and, and it's been kind of a bottleneck to try to get some of the right forms filled out and to have that and then line up builders. And so that's, so there, there will be, and you'll see things in Smith Center and Troy's district and others of bringing in, bringing in folks. And so I think even short-term solutions are working on. Uh, there's been revitalization or, 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 or revamping of trying to revitalize the program for downtown, maybe from those lofts. Right. Most of our, even our smaller communities have great downtowns and have that second floor that probably have been occupied for 50 or 60 years and would bring great character. I think that'd be so, a neat place to sure. live. Yeah, and there's some of that in Hayes going right. on as well. Well, and then the other thing with, with the, the, house, the rural housing that we did last year, we pumped nearly $100 million mm -hmm. into housing initiatives across the state of Kansas. And you're talking about the Kansas Housing Resource Corporation that would probably deal with anywhere in prior years of maybe $20 million. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then to have an influx wow. of that much money. And actually next week at Appropriations, we're having the Kansas Housing Resource Co Corporation give us an update on yeah. what they're doing as far as we, the housing initiatives that yeah. we passed last year. We, we worked hard, did a lot of arm twisting to get a lot of money yes. for them to, to shore that up as we move forward. Mm -hmm. we're, it's, and we're starting to see with, it. With the spe specifics that it goes to rural. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the biggest thing for Ken and I, is that we wanted this to go to the rural parts of the state. Mm -hmm. Because housing is an issue everywhere, uh, in your urban areas and your rural areas. Um, but the cost to build is more excessive in your rural areas than it is. Well, in and, it, and area. it's gone up so much. Yes. I keep hearing that in discussions. The materials have gone up. The materials as yeah. well, yeah, you know, and inflation, as you right. mentioned. Well, here's what's going to save us, some people <laughs> think. Legalized sports betting. We have a big game coming up Sunday. We know the Chiefs are going to win, yeah. right? Of course, yes. the Kansas City Chiefs are going to win. There's going to be a lot of uh, sports betting going on in Kansas. Won't that make us some money? No. No. It doesn't. It's, it's, I, I feel bad that I did vote for it because it was a bad deal. We were at a point, and again, I don't want to speak for you because you may think differently than me. But I think the situation is we, 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 our constituents wanted it, so we had it. But the deal is it's, it's, a, it's, it's a small margin. Mm -hmm. We see all these advertisements mm -hmm. of do this, $200 free, free bet. Some of those what I consider some fuzzy math on some of those as we looked at it in appropriations. Uh, I would like to reopen it, but we still have a few more years where we can do it and, and really kind of see where this whole situation goes. Because again, our surrounding states did it. We want to make sure we had it. And this that's a very simplistic answer. I know uh, Chairman Waymaster probably has a much better answer, maybe a different philosophy than Troy, mine. Troy, we've got about a minute left. Can oh, you, a minute? That's it? Yeah. yeah so, uh, so we're looking at about $10 million in revenue from sports betting. And when you consider what the state receives from the Kansas lottery, is about $78 million. Oh, uh, gosh. Annually. It's, it's not that much. It, it, some speculations were that we'd be receiving 30 to $40 million. It's not anywhere near that. Um, obviously, uh, it, it does help that we have sports betting and Missouri does not. 
The other issue that complicates it is that we had to open up the contracts with the casinos, the four state-owned casinos in the state. Uh -huh. um, and even though we had discussions with them when we were passing sports betting, we have a pending lawsuit with one of those four state-owned casinos mm -hmm. um, because they don't like the parameters of sports betting. So it, it's very difficult to reinvent the wheel, uh, per se, in regards to sports betting because right now we might be in pending litigation. Well, we'll be anxious to hear <laughs> about that. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time well, this evening. You. We have been visiting with our legislators. Uh, Troy, of course, talking to us about uh, the budget and the numbers this evening, and also Ken talking to us a little bit about that and uh, some of the things that he's been doing. Again, thank you for your work at well, Topeka. It really does make a difference, and we hope that you will join us next time. We thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm your host for the Kansas Legislature legislature Becky Kaiser enjoy your evening have a great weekend in our increasingly electrified society that's where a resilient grid matters most ITC Great Plains builds operates and maintains electric transmission infrastructure connecting consumers to lower cost energy sources to power our energy future that means safe secure reliable electricity for those we serve Learn more at itc-holdings.com.